You are listening to Brigade Radio 1. Time for another episode of Combat Radio, the pandemic version with social distancing. Uh, this episode is going to focus uh, on the return of one of our friends, Director Nicholas Meyer. You know from Wrath and Con, Undiscovered Country, Time After Time, Volunteers, a barrage of classics. He's, off, he's also the author of some Sherlock Holmes books. We're going to get into that and other bits of craziness momentarily. But before we buckle up for that damage, I just want to remind everyone that the book that came out on us is available on Amazon, Brigade Radio 1 slash Combat Radio, live at the Canyon Year 1. Features all the backstage stories, trivia, photos, craziness with everyone from like Grammy winner Pancho Sanchez to Vince Neal to the Smithereens to Patrick Warburton, the English Beat, members of Oingo Boingo, Jeff Tate of Queensryche, The Temptations, My Girl, Air Supply, of course, Fab Four. Pretty brilliant, actually. It goes into, I'm not saying it's brilliant because it's on us, it's just really brilliantly on the people did. I mean, look here, even micro wrestling, right? Right? Amazon. Get the book, and if you really want to appreciate it thoroughly, I'll be happy to autograph it for you. Also, our Patreon, Patreon slash Brigade Radio 1, is being redirected to help with our charity work and the work we do with social services. You can get involved there for three bucks a month, five bucks a month. We're going to try and give you a bunch of rewards to make it worth your while, including giveaways. And when the world opens back up, we got all kinds of tickets and everything else we're going to dump on you for being a hero. Patreon slash Brigade Radio 1. All right, so that's that. We'll be back right now with Nicholas Mahler. All right, everyone. Well, I promised you something special, and it doesn't get much better than this. One of our favorite directors and authors is with us. He's back with us because he likes to torture himself. Uh, he's got a barrage of great credits, but he's been doing a lot of work on the book front, including a new Sherlock Holmes novel, and he's got something else he just wrapped up. Director, writer, Nicholas Meyer. Nicholas, how are you? I'm fine. I'm happy to report. Are you in your dungeon? Is that where the creative magic happens right there? I'm in my office. I never leave it. So sometimes it's creative, sometimes it's magic, and sometimes I'm just trapped. Yeah, just like all of us. Hey, I got to tell you, I love the new Sherlock Holmes book. I heard the audio book. It's been, I've heard it twice. I really like it. And it's interesting because it kind of goes in a place you can feel Sherlock Holmes would naturally go, but don't expect him to go. Good job on it. Thank you very much. I'm glad to learn you enjoyed it. And you heard the audio version. I did, yes. The audio version was read by a friend of mine named David Robb. And David Robb, I directed with Pierce Brosnan in a movie for Merchant Ivory uh, called The Deceivers. And David was very good, and we've all been friends ever since. And when it came time to try to find who was going to be the voice of Watson. And I, I didn't want a kind of modern sort of Euro trash voice. I really wanted an older generation Oxbridge yeah. act. Then I thought about David and I suggested him to my publisher, St. Martin's Press. And uh, they said, okay. And so uh, I said, I will of course direct the reading. So I was in the studio with David and he made a great Watson. And, and uh, he also, for your listeners, he also plays the doctor on Downton Abbey. He was in I, Claudius. He's been in a million movies and stuff. He's got a long list of credits. Um, and I learned to my surprise that other people had thought that he would make a terrific Watson. They always wanted to pair him up with Daniel Day-Lewis as Holmes and David Robb as Watson. I thought it'd be a good idea. That is a good idea. You know, speaking of Sherlock Holmes, you once shamed me, and probably rightfully so, for me telling you how much I like the Basil Rathbone-Nigel Bruce combination. And you said to me one day in the studio, you go, why would somebody so smart hang out with a bumbling idiot? And, you know, you think about it, you go, yeah, I guess... I guess you're right. I guess Nigel Bruce was paired more for like comedy. He was. He was. It, it, they they turned it into a sort of camp thing. I have to say that you know when I started reading Sherlock Holmes and I emphasize that I was reading it, I wasn't watching it. But I was about eleven years old, um, and 
I glommed on to how real it seemed to me. Uh, I was a kid and it, it seemed real. And that kind of, you know, you, you imprint as a kid on everything, whether it's people or experiences or works of art. And I imprinted on Arthur Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes how it was written. So when I started to see movies, and of course you wind up seeing Basil Rathbone or Nigel Bruce, and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not how it is. And I became a sort of arch conservative, the only area in which I could be called an arch conservative, where Sherlock Holmes was concerned. I wanted the I wanted it how Doyle wrote it. I wanted it that he was a cocaine addict. I wanted that he played the violin. Um, I didn't want to try to figure out why a genius hangs out with a buffoon. When you read the stories, one of the things that you learn is that Holmes was not without vanity. And that vanity, I, it seems to me, demanded or craved the admiration of a regular guy, not a sub-regular guy. And I just never believed that the Nigel Bruce character who spoke in those movies was the guy who wrote down the stories, which is who wrote them down, is, is Doyle as Watson. So I didn't mean to shame anybody. I was just expressing an opinion by throwing up. Um, but uh, that was my, you know, I think Basil Rathbone, by the way, might have made an excellent Holmes, but virtually in my experience, he, he was never given the chance. Well, your opinion matters, and I know you weren't deliberately shaming us, but I, I, you know, you got the Oscar nomination for the 7% Solution. You had in that movie, uh, Laurence Olivier as Moriarty, who's at the time, especially considered one of the greatest living legends of the stage, right? So you are in a place where you can talk about all this stuff. I, but one thing I never think I ever asked you about Sherlock Holmes is, do you actually have a favorite story? Uh, no, but I have several. I have several. Um, Silver Blaze, the Bruce Partington plans, the Devil's Foot, the Red-Headed League. Um, in a way, the Speckled Band, even though it's real nonsense because snakes can't hear, apparently. Um, but that didn't stop me, you know. I, I, I and it evidently didn't stop Doyle either. Um, those are some of the ones that I really, really love. And there are more. When you think about it, Doyle, starting in 1887 and ending when in the 1920, whatever, wrote 60, 6 0 Sherlock Holmes stories, 56 short ones, and four novellas. And inevitably, some are better than others, and some are not good at all. But the overall level of quality is really kind of astonishing. And what's more, your listeners may or may not be aware, but after 1916, Arthur Conan Doyle became a pronounced spiritualist. He went public that he believed that you could contact the dead. And whether you use Ouija board or automatic writing or any of that stuff, he, he devoted the last 15 years of his life to proselytizing on behalf of spiritualism. I should point out that during and following the First World War, when many people lost loved ones, lost brothers, husbands, fathers, sons, in those trenches, that yes, there was perhaps an understandable rise in spiritualism. Doyle had lost a son, a brother, a brother-in-law. It was heavy. So I'm not making fun of him. I'm not blaming him. But what I'm leading up to was the fact that in an astonishing act of sort of literary integrity, 
he never turned Holmes into a believer. He never made Holmes an apologist for his own beliefs or a proselytizer. On the contrary, Holmes says to Watson, uh, I take it that neither of us are prepared to, to um, acknowledge diabolical intrusions into the affairs of men. This agency stands flat-footed on the ground. No ghosts need apply. That's pretty good for a guy that was right in the opposite of what he thought. Yeah, that's brilliant. But what do you make of that? What do you make of him writing the opposite of what he thought? And how would you sum up Doyle to someone on the street who may not be too familiar with the man or the work? Well, I think he, he made Holmes true to the character that he always was. He did not suborn his nature or his values to his own. And authors are supposed to do that. They're, they're, they're supposed to, unless you're, you know, preaching. And he didn't, he didn't preach through Sherlock Holmes. Arthur Conan Doyle was a doctor. He was a Scot. He came from a Catholic family. He uh, studied medicine in Edinburgh. And uh, after he became a doctor, he was waiting for patients to show up. And I guess they were scarce. So he started writing short stories and selling them to magazines for money. And quite sort of by accident, because he wrote all different kind of stories, he created this character who was originally called Sharonford Holmes, and somehow Sharonford became, became Sherlock, and there are all kinds of stories about whether this was a cricket player that he knew or what the background was. But anyway, and he, he created this sidekick, uh, Dr. John Watson. Um, and interestingly enough, they meet because Watson has returned from Afghanistan, which is the graveyard of all ambition of a Western nature, whether it's British or Russian or America. You get nowhere in Afghanistan. And Watson was badly wounded in the Second Afghan War, serving in the British Army. Comes back to London with his health in tatters and answers an ad for someone who's looking for, for a roommate, someone to go halves on a set of rooms in Baker Street. And that's how he meets and is astonished by this Sherlock Holmes character, who's basically a chemist. Um, and Doyle uh, became a wild success with, he wrote a, a novel called A Study in Scarlet. Study in Scarlet is the first Sherlock Holmes book. It was published in 1887. And it was, it, I guess it was successful in England, but it was really successful in America. And Here's the good part. The editor of Lippincott's American Magazine came to London and took Arthur Conan Doyle and another guy, another writer, to dinner. And he commissioned another uh, work from each of them. From Arthur Conan Doyle, he wanted another Sherlock Holmes story, and that was The Sign of the Four. The other writer just happened to be Oscar Wilde. And the book he wrote was The Picture of Dorian Gray. That must have been quite a dinner. That's on Monday. <laughs> Very yeah. Well to know. yeah. You can write a short story about just a dinner. That's probably the dinner to write it on. People, you know, people have, have speculated about that, that dinner. A guy named Sam Rosenberg wrote about it in a book called Naked is the Best Disguise. Anyway, that was that's Doyle. And the, the, the postscript to this, since you asked me to explain to your listeners who he was, was that Doyle had created in Holmes a character that he couldn't kill off. And he got to the point where he wanted to kill him off. He got sick of writing it um, after six stories. Uh, and his mother, who kind of ran a lot of his life, said, you are not killing him off. 
and we kept him alive for another six stories. But he was writing other stuff. He was writing sci-fi. He was writing historical novels. His, his big masterpiece is a book called The White Company, which was John Ford's favorite uh, book and his dream project. It was like the Three Musketeers. It was like the Count of Monte Cristo. Um, but I think people today don't get the title, The White Company. They think it's about a company. Anyway, he wanted readers to pay attention to that. He wrote the original version of King Kong. It was called The Lost World. And it was about dinosaurs living on a plateau in South America. Uh, so Holmes got on his nerves. Uh, and he tried to kill him off. And then he killed him off. He created a nemesis, Professor Moriarty. And they go over the waterfalls in Switzerland. You would think that would kill them. But he must have known somewhere that this was not ultimately a good idea. So the body of Holmes is never found. So that later, when he does come back, and turns out he survived the waterfall, because he was never in it, as he explains to Watson, he could come back and keep going, and he did. I wanted to actually uh, direct our listeners to uh, our archives, where there's a brilliant story that Nicholas tells about the casting of Robert Duvall as Watson in The 7% Solution. I'm not going to take everyone around. I'm not going to circle the wagons on it here, but it's brilliant, and it shows sort of some intrepid casting psychological moves applied by Nicholas. But I also remember you and I were having a laugh about how much we appreciated without a clue, which is basically. Oh, it's terrific. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, For your doc, listeners, without a clue is the movie where Sherlock is the dummy and Watson right. is the smart one. Michael Caine is Holmes and Ben Kingsley is Watson. Yes. The crime doctor. Crime doctor. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's actually, the, it, my daughter is a huge Rathbone fan from that series of movies, but whenever you need a good laugh, that movie is probably number one to reach for. It's I so would, I really wouldn't mind seeing it again. I really wouldn't mind seeing it again. I wonder if I have it. I'm going to it. It's out there. If you don't have it, I can get it to you. Let me ask you real quick about the new book you just finished. It's another Sherlock Holmes novel. And it's called A Study in Gold. And Sherlock Holmes winds up in Egypt looking for a missing archaeologist. Mm. Well, I like the setting. Hey, I've got a question for you to change gears real quick. Well, let me ask you this. Do you know when that book is going to be available to us, the new one? Around Christmas, I imagine. Okay. So... I thought maybe I'd buy a few copies of your recent Holmes book and maybe you can sign them and we can auction them off for uh, social services or the food bank. Of course. I'll bounce um, that. I'll bounce yeah, around to that after the interview. What's that? I'll drive out to where you are and sign them. Yeah, perfect. I'll go ahead and take care of that and circle back on that. Hey, so not too long ago, uh, there's an argument, you know, you've been a director and a writer for a long time. I worked at Warner Brothers Feature Development, and I heard an argument that would, you know, basically drive someone to into insanity about how in your movie, Wrath of Khan, Chekhov would have not have met Khan. And I couldn't believe this was an argument I was hearing. And they were trying to justify, from a fictional standpoint, how that would have happened, how Chekhov and Khan would have met. Another part of the boat. What's that? I just said he was on another part of the boat. Yeah, it's it's amazing how passionate these fans of Trek actually were about it and trying to engineer like plausible concepts for how they would have met. And it's like, you know, you get to a point in development where you're just like, look, that's just the way the script is going to go. I thought because Chekhov is always a target. He's always the one that's wounded or kicked around. Oh, is that so? Yeah. It seems like it, that that's, that's why he was the guy to get the bug in his ear, which, by the way, how did you come up with that? Well, the short answer is that I didn't come up with most of it. To, to remind your uh, listeners, when I was invited to meet Harv Bennett, who was going to produce the second Star Trek feature, uh, I had never seen Star Trek, so I didn't know anything about it. When I was in college, I had a friend who used to watch it every day. He used to drop acid and watch it every day. 
Uh, and I tried looking at it and I didn't understand it because I never understand anything until I'm the last person to understand it. So I didn't get it. It was like a guy with pointy ears and people in, running around in PJs and that was all I, I saw. So when they showed me the movie and they showed me some of the episodes and I became interested in Star Trek. And I became interested in Star Trek because it reminded me of something that I loved as a kid, along with Sherlock Holmes, was a series of novels called The Adventures of Captain Horatio Hornblower. And Horatio Hornblower was a British uh, captain in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. And he had lots of adventures and he had a girl in every port. And when you're 13 years old, this stuff seems really cool. They're awfully well written by the guy named C who called himself, wasn't his real name, C.S. Forrester. And C.S. Forrester also wrote The African Queen. So he was a pretty good writer. And I thought, oh, Star Trek, this is Captain Hornblower in outer space. I could do this. I could do this. This is submarines. This is torpedoes. This is destroyers. This is a movie that I also loved called The Enemy Below with Robert Mitchum and, and Kurt Juergens. Remember who directed that movie? No one you, ever. You quizzed me on it. Was it Powell? Dick Powell. Dick, Dick Powell. Powell. Anyway, so I got interested in this and I, and I looked up and it was like, I don't know, three, four weeks later. And the script, which Harv had told me was coming in, draft five. Uh, I said, what happened? And Harv said, uh, I, I don't like it. It isn't good. He, he used blunter language. Uh, and I can't show it to you. And I said, what about draft four, draft three, or whatever? And he said, kid, you don't get it. All these are simply discreet attempts to realize a second Star Trek movie their contents are unrelated. And I said, oh, um, let, me, let me read the script. And he said, really? I said, yeah, come on, because I, I was now stoked about Hornblower in space. In those days, you didn't hit send. In those days, a van drove up. And it was like, we had this ton of script. And I'm a slow reader, but I waded through all of them. And basically what I did, I said to Harv, let me write a new script. Let's just make a list of everything we like in these five scripts. It could be a major plot. It could be a subplot. Could be a sequence. Could be a scene. Could be a character. Could be a line of dialogue. I don't care. I want to make a list and I'll just try to incorporate these things. So the thing in the ear, Kirk meeting his son, Khan, the Genesis project, the simulator sequence. These are all scattered in five different scripts. And it was my job to unify them into one story somehow. Lieutenant Savick, that was another one. I didn't know anything about any of this. I was just trying to jerry rig a narrative in which they were all these things that we agreed we wanted would be utilized. And all the dialogue is mine, with about four exceptions that Harv wrote, which were very funny. Um, but basically, that's where the ear, that's, that's the long-winded, because I'm long-winded, that's the long-winded explanation of where the ear bug came from, not from me. It came from, you know, one of the drafts. You know, a lot of it's a lot has been made about Leonard Nimoy coming back for that, that you maybe promised him the death scene to I didn't promise him anything. It was Harv Bennett who allegedly said to him, If you come back, we'll give you a memorable death scene, and then turned to me and said, Where's the deaths? <laughs> the memorable death scene. And is the death scene in the movie the first one you came up with for him? Yeah. But right out of the gate, you said he's going to die at the end saving the ship, basically. That didn't take much development from you. I don't think so. Uh, you know, 
a lot of it was like fiddling with a Rubik's cube. Um, for example, and I don't remember all of this because you know it happened back in the Pleistocene era, but um, they had a sequence where one of the scripts had a sequence that happened in a simulator. And it was like page 35 or page 40. And Spock wasn't in it. And we're starting to make this movie and, and I moved the simulator sequence to the opening. Um, and we were getting letters, you know, if Spock dies, you die and all kind of, all that sort of the crazies coming out of the woodwork. And I was sitting next to Harvard behind him in a screening room at Paramount. And we were looking at special effects footage and talking about this. And I was like talking to myself and I said, we should kill him off in the opening in the simulator sequence. And Harvard whirled around and he said, that is genius. And I, I said, what, what did I say again? Because I wasn't there. Um, and so things happened like that. Mm. And I don't remember how I wound up writing the death scene that I did. Yes, he was going to save the ship. And one, you know, the, the script was written very fast, that first draft. It was written very fast. So you were like mixing and matching and throwing things in. Did I notice that Kirk and Khan never met? I did not. I was going too fast for that. And then later it was like, no, I, they don't need to meet. It doesn't seem right. Um, and so we just left it the way it had come out. There were a lot of adjustments that got made, a lot. But the only way I know how to write, as the caterpillar says to Alice, begin at the beginning. And when you get to the end, stop. And so I started, and once I knew where we were heading, then it was a question of laying in the pipe that would make things look inevitable and where the audience would prepare for it. One of the things that I learned is that the audience typically does not remember the first five minutes of the movie. They're getting adjusted, they're eating their popcorn, they're orienting themselves. And by the time you're an hour into the movie, you may have forgotten that this is the movie where Spock dies. And partially because you'd already seen him die in the opening to the degree that you remembered anything. Oh yeah, he doesn't really die. It was, a, it was just a simulator, you know, death. So you forget, you forget until you, at this crucial juncture of the narrative, see the empty chair. And suddenly you go, oh, wait, this is about him dying. But all the pipe has been laid for that. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. I have been and always shall be your friend. All that stuff got laid in because I knew that's where we were going. Well, I love the cinematography in the opening, and I also like how you introduced the new Enterprise. You know, I was, I don't know if I've ever asked you, but was Ricardo okay with not having a confrontation with Kirk, or did he request any changes, or did he just take the script and do Never. it as read? Never. The thing about Montalban, who was a really lovely man and a brilliant actor, a brilliant actor who seldom was given parts worthy of his talents, when I watched him as Khan, I said, you really should be playing Lear. Because he sort of was playing Lear. And he made some self-deprecatory comment about his Hispanic accent. And I said, no one's going to care. You, are, you enunciate beautifully, one can understand every word. And he had more credits than everybody else put together. And his job, as he saw it, was to show up once he had committed to the role um, and say what was on the page and make it believable. That was his job. 
And he was very smart. When he first read the script, he said he wasn't in the movie very much. And then he read it again. He said, yeah, but when I'm not there, they're always talking about me. Mm -hmm. That seemed good to him. Um, and he was very, very directable. And he knew that he needed to be directed. He, he said to me, I don't know what I'm doing up there. So he needed, and a director in that capacity is really a kind of audience, really kind of an audience. And I would say to him, you know, you can go really small because a crazy person doesn't have to raise their voice because you never know what they're going to do next. And he jumped back and he totally got the idea of it. And then you didn't have to finish sentences for him. He would finish them for you. Tell me about the moment when you realized the movie was a hit, either in the screening process or when it hit the box office and Harv's reaction when he had basically realized he had turned this franchise around. Well, it was interesting that there were, there were two moments when we realized, I think, that the film was successful and the first one was when we realized that it was aesthetically successful and that was a screening that we held on the lot at paramount in what is now the sherry lansing theater and that's a theater that seats about 400 people and they went nuts and we just sort of stood at the back with these sort of idiot shit-eating grins we didn't know what to make of this and of course that answers the aesthetic question because audiences are the same they'll always laugh in the same place they'll always be bored in the same place they'll always they're the same and we would have other screenings and it was always the same what we didn't know was what the late Ted Ashley, who used to be in charge at Warner Brothers, used to call the tom-tom factor. Is anybody going to come out and see it? And in those days, uh, it was a lot about what reviewers said, what the critics said. So I was in New York when the movie opened, and we all waited up to get the New York Times to see Janet Maslin. And her first line, which I happen to remember, was, well, this is more like it. And at that point, you know, we were gangbusters. I can't speak for what Harv thought, and I'm sorry he's not around to speak for himself. What I, excuse me, can say is that I had no knowledge, how could I, or foreknowledge, that this thing would go on and on and on, you know, promoting uh, or begetting imitations and spoofs and claymation Italian operas and, and that Kirk's yell would, would become this sort of famous thing. There was, there was none of that. But in retrospect, all is well. All I can be is I can't help wondering about the friend profoundly right grateful, profoundly grateful um, that so many people, that the movie has and meant so much and has worn from evidently so well for so long. Um, you know, I think movies are a little bit like souffles. They either rise or they don't. And half the time you never know why, because you had all the same ingredients. Get everything right, and then it just lies there. Um, we both have history with different feature development departments at different studios, but I think they probably realized there was going to be a Star Trek three fairly quick. And I'm just kind of curious: at what point did they did somebody put their hand up and be like, "What about Spock? He's dead now." Um, that happened before the movie was finished. Did it? Yes. Um. And I think one of the first people who was aware of this was Leonard, 
who started wondering if he hadn't been a little hasty. And we did change the ending of the movie, which, by the way, I fought tooth and nail, but I was probably wrong. Um, in the original, he dies, they shoot him off into space, and that's it. And people love the movie, but they were, everybody was sobbing. I have been, and always shall be, your friend. Live long and prosper. Harv said to me, we have to do something. We have to give people hope. And I said, this is disgusting. You're, you, you've wrenched people, you've played with their emotions and the whole thing is gonna be a dry hustle because in movies and sci-fi, nobody dies. That's, I think that's reprehensible, I think is what I, the word I grabbed at, but I was overruled, and so we filmed this scene uh, in the Botanical Gardens in San Francisco with the coffin lying there, and uh, I must return to this place and so on. Then they offered to me to direct Star Trek III, and I said, what's that about? And they said, oh, it's, you know, he comes back to life. I said, is that what we call resurrection? because I don't know how to do resurrection, so let this cup pass me by. And uh, so they did it without me. But how soon after Star Trek II and its success were you contacted after passing on three to get back involved? Because they've always seemed to go back to you. <laughs> yeah, they used to. Um, well, I was not involved in Star Trek IV until I got a call from Dawn Steele, my friend who was head of production at the time. Uh, and she said, you gotta come in here real fast, we have a problem. And so I, uh, I was, I think it was on the lot, or because I was on the lot for 14 years. Anyway, I went into her office and she said, look, uh, we have a script, we have a story, we like the story, but we don't like the script. We want to start over, and I, and we, and we're about to go into pre-production. <laughs> and I said, "Well, what's the story?" And she said, "Go ask Harvin Leonard." So I schlep across the lot to their office, and they tell me the story about the whales. And I said, "Should I read the script?" And they go, "No, no, no! Don't read the script." Um, and, and basically, all I can gather, because I didn't read it, was that a huge role had been written in that draft for Eddie Murphy. And Paramount was not going to put their two golden eggs, Star Trek and Eddie Murphy, in one basket. So they wanted to start all over, only we only had about 15 minutes. Um, and so they told me the story and I said, gee, it sounds kind of like time after time. They, 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 they go to San Francisco, but they come from the future instead of the past. Can't we go someplace else? Can't we go to Paris? Why can't we go to Paris? And they yes. said, the whales won't fit in the river or something. So, so basically, Harv said, I'll write the parts in outer space and you write the parts on Earth. And so I did, and I recycled a lot of things that I had cut out of time after time. And that's how I wound up 
doing it. I think um, my first line is when Spock says, Judging by the pollution content of the atmosphere, I believe we have arrived at the latter half of the 20th century. And Kirk says, everybody remember where we parked. And I got to remember all my jokes. I mean, to put them in and had a really good time. That goes back to what we were saying earlier, because Chekhov gets his head busted open. And, uh, and again, when you need a guy to get wounded or tortured, it always seems to fall on Chekhov. And I wonder if that's sort of a personal thing on the actor or the character. I don't know. You know, I don't really know. I'm not a Star Trek expert. Um, if I had it to do all over again, maybe it would have been Sulu. You came back for Undiscovered Country, right? And you, so you obviously wanted to continue to direct within the franchise. But you didn't have to do it. Well, I was, I was offered to do it. Um, the Frank Mancuso and Martin Davis, those people who were running Paramount, they were not happy with five. And they didn't want to go out with the original cast on that movie. Uh, and they asked me if I had an idea for another Star Trek movie, and I never have ideas, so I said, I don't. And then Leonard came and visited me, uh, and we spent a day, and he always had ideas. And so he said, you know, the Klingons have always been our stand-ins for the Russians. And this was like 1989, and the wall had just come down in Berlin. And he said, well, what if the wall comes down on outer space? And that was all I needed. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We start with an intergalactic Chernobyl. Boom, boom. Klingon Empire is going to be unbreathable, and they all got to leave. And, and I just, just went from there. It was automatic. But he had to prime the pump. So three, like, epic guns resurfaced for this movie, right? David Warner, who played Jack the Ripper for you in Time After Time. Brock Peters an actor I've always loved, and Christopher Plummer, who is probably the last person anyone thought would play a Klingon, but is brilliant. Uh, do you ever sit around, did you ever sit around on the set and go, I've got to direct these legends? Or was it fairly easy to you? Were they, were they directable? Oh, they were, yeah, they were very directable. I, I have to say regarding Chris Plummer, that's the only time other than the Star Trek cast that I ever wrote a role for an actor. And I said to uh, um, Mary Jo Slater, who was our casting director, I said, if you can't get Christopher Plummer, there's no movie. And I came to Christopher Plummer because I had this CD, I still have it, of uh, Plummer doing excerpts from Henry V. And I would just, lie in bed at night listening to Henry V on this, it's a Chandos CD for those of your listeners who would like to get it. Um, and I thought, wow, if I could get him to do something like this, a Shakespeare spouting villain, uh, and I would get Chris Plummer. And she went off and, you know, came back with the bit between her teeth and said, you know, like a terrier and said, I got him. Um, and I found him a delight. I, I found him a delight, and uh, he was a, a total pro. Brock Peters was interesting because um, he was a, also a tremendous talent, but he had a speech that was very difficult for him to say. And basically, he plays a racist, and he's a racist where Klingons are concerned. And he couldn't get through this racist speech in one take. It was so distressing to him that I had to shoot it in, in sections. Lovely, lovely man and, and never demurred about what he was being asked to do. Never objected. He just found it, his brain couldn't sort of wrap itself around those particular horrible sentiments. Hey, what about the casting or the appearance of Christian Slater and all that. Whose call was that? Well, it was my call because Mary Jo was his mother. 
And Mary Jo said, you know, Christian is a Star Trek fool. Can he do anything in the movie? So I wrote him this little role and we filmed him. So you couldn't quite be sure. Is that, is that, is that who I think it is? And uh, that's how he wound up in the movie. Are there any other moments in the movies or in the franchise where there's like producers as Federation officers or is there any sort of that inside job anywhere that we may not be aware of? Well, James Horner is in Star Trek too. Where? He's one of the crew racing around when they're getting ready for battle. Um, he's in uniform, he rushes by. And... You know who actually loved their time on that movie of all people is Nicholas Guest. Well, he's kind of memorable in it. Yeah, he came through the studio and that was one of his highlights. He talked Long Riders, Christmas Vacation, and Star Trek too. And I just thought, I don't know if you'd ever heard that from him, so I'm gonna tell you so you hear it. I've seen him in years, I'd love to see him. Yeah, well, we'll have to get him back in the studio when we can get you both, after this pandemic, we'll get you both in there together. We'll have a like a reunion of sorts. Do you have a favorite movie in Undiscovered, or a favorite moment rather, in Undiscovered Country or Wrath of Khan? Do you ever sit back and go, that's the moment, that makes the franchise for me, that's the thing I'm most proud of? I don't think in terms of franchise. I just can concentrate on one story. I have a favorite shot. In, what is it? In, in the rest. It's uh, in the torpedo bay where there, this torpedo is coming at you and they've loaded it up. And uh, I built that whole set just for that because I kept thinking it should be like running out the guns or putting torpedoes in the, in the submarine. And, and I, it, I, it was interesting because I was talking to a, a friend, a very gifted uh, television writer, John McNamara, who also wrote uh, Trumbo, if you saw that movie. Really yeah. good. Well, anyway, John, who's a lovely guy, um, we were, for some reason, discussing this. And I said, that's my favorite shot in the movie, even though it's a ridiculous anachronism. And he said to me, what do you mean anachronism? All the electrics were out. They had to do it by hand. And he had created this whole alternate scenario, which is what you really want an audience to do, is to meet you halfway. And this guy was, he was in my lap. He was so far more than halfway. He said, yeah, of course, there was no electrics. They had to do it by hand. And he had created a whole rationale for my anachronistic moment. No, we love it because, right, at that moment, the pacing has to be ratcheted up. And these guys are running around with what looks like fuel cans and weapons and you know whether or not there's any real rhyme or reason like the pacing requires it. it's like that's what gets everyone into pole position right brilliant job brother thank you so what's next for you obviously the new book that comes out in december um you know have you, when was the last time you saw david warner can i ask you that you've worked with him a number of times yes i have worked with david a number of times i haven't seen him in years and not for any particular reason, unless you count this, you know, bubonic plague that's going around. Um, but I, I have not seen him for a long time. And I wouldn't mind seeing him at all. Uh, he's a lovely man. And very gifted, my God. I've got one question here that was tweeted to us. And maybe this opens up another segment between us on the radio in the future. But the question is, ask Nicholas if it's true that his Klingon prison was also the same caves used in the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I don't know. That's the response then. I don't know. So a film historian will tell us because somebody somewhere they know. You say the Klingon prison. I, I'm not sure what you mean. Like the Aurora Pente, right? Oh, Rura Pente was uh, up in Bronson Canyon, I believe, is, is, and that may well have been. I wouldn't be at all surprised to learn that, that cave was the cave where Dana Winter kisses Kevin McCarthy and he realizes that she's now a pod person. I think it's possible. The answer is it's possible. That's going to be my response. It's possible. And all things are possible where Nicholas Meyer is concerned. I want to thank you for taking the time, man. It's always great to talk to you. I'm sorry about the pandemic. It puts us apart, but you are one of our favorites and you've been nothing less than a hero when it's come to our social service work, man. So I thank you. You got anything in closing for us? 
Yeah, you should go out and buy my book. We didn't talk about my book. Um, well, we did talk about the book, and I would recommend the book. Uh, and again, it's voiced by the actor of Downton Abbey. Let's circle around to the book real quick before we break away. What compelled you to make it about the Protocols of Zion? Ever since Donald Trump, I have been very interested in fake news and interested in, in, you know, sort of this finger pointing and fake this and fake that. And so I thought maybe I would tackle Donald Trump through the protocols of the elders of Zion. What is it about those? What do you think it is about those protocols or? Because they won't die. No well, matter how, why, why won't they? Why? Why? Why won't they die? That's a very good question. I think people are always in search of scapegoats. Mm. We're all conspiracy theorists. The notion, like you know, that Moriarty, for example, is the Napoleon of crime. That there is some malign force at the center of everything. That when when Holmes is talking to Watson about. Moriarty, he, he, he talks about he's at the spider of his center of his web and there's all these radiations out. We're always looking for somebody who's like really the bad person. And the protocols say, yeah, it's the Jews. And, you know, and that serves a lot of people very well. It's very popular in the Middle East, the protocols. It's a TV series in Egypt. Is it? Yep. Well, when the book opens, without Hulk, what's that? I think it was called Night Without Armor. When your book opens, Sherlock is like very skeptical, about, almost reluctant, it seems like, to even take the assignment because he believes it to all be nonsense. He, 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 he thinks it's bullshit. And right. He, he's not wrong. The thing he's wrong about is how dangerous they are, even being bullshit. Mm -hmm. And they were exposed very early, the, the protocols. And just to remind your listeners, you, you can Google the protocols of the elders of Zion, read all about them. But they were concocted in about 1903 by the secret police of Tsar Nicholas II, the Okhrana. And they were concocted in order to blame someone for the pogroms that took place in Tsarist Russia. Um, and very early on, they were exposed as fraudulent, <laughs> and who wrote them, and where they were, <clears throat> excuse me, copied from, and so forth, forged, plagiarized from something that had nothing to do with Jews. Um, but no matter, and then Henry Ford published the protocols complete in his newspaper in the in the 1920s, and he got sued for slander and libel, and he had to issue a retraction and close his newspaper. And his newspaper had the biggest circulation of any paper except the Daily News. Mm. Uh, uh, so it, it was a big deal to close that. It was called a Dearborn Independent. Um, but they're, they're still published, they're still online, they're still available, and they're still preposterous. And very boring, by the way. Man, oh man. Page after page. Well, the book is called The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols. It's been one of my favorites. It's probably my favorite book all year that I've read, and I'd recommend the audio version. It's available everywhere. Thank but the you. audio version travels really well when you're in the car. And uh, I look forward to seeing what you got coming our way in December. And maybe we can uh, sort of map out a Q&A with the book, uh, an online Q&A where your Sherlock Holmes fan base can ask you all the questions that are mysterious yes no maybe i'm ready <laughs> <laughs> anything from you in closing brother stay safe stay safe i realize that we are in a terrible dilemma yeah the worst torture that you can give to anybody apparently worse than waterboarding is to keep people in isolation we just we, we're we're social creatures and what's more we need to work, we need to work to make a living. And it's very, very hard, it's counterintuitive to stay at home and 
arguably not have enough to eat in order not to spread this wretched thing all over the place. That's a tough one. Yeah. I, I wish everybody good luck and I and just stay safe. Stay safe indeed. Well, listen, Nicholas, it's always a pleasure. Uh, you are one of our favorites, and I hope we can get together soon. If not, uh, in the studio, maybe on Zoom again before this thing winds down. You're a good man. Uh, much respect for you, brother. Thank you. Take care. Come. Khan, you've got Genesis, but you don't have me. You are going to kill me, Khan. You're going to have to come down here. You're going to have to come down here. I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. And I wish to go on hurting you. I shall leave you as you left me. As you left her. My own for all eternity in the center of a dead planet. Buried alive. Buried alive. Come! Come! You're listening to Brigade Radio 1.